All right, friends, I have that it's time. It is so great to see you today, and um, I'm all smiles this morning. So let me share with you why. I, I know many of you saw an email yesterday that's going out. Uh, there will also be a, a letter, but it's an exciting time in the life of the church. If I had told you uh, that I would be standing here today telling you that a dozen families have joined the church in the month of January, I would have thought we were drinking too much Christmas eggnog and uh, hoping, I mean, it's an exciting season. Um, but uh, as I get carried away with 2022 blessings and the excitement of that, uh, I want to pause for a minute and look back at the end of 2021. Uh, many of you were there on uh, November 30th when I stood up and let people know that we really needed $1.5 million to be able to cover our expenses for the year. I'm so excited to report to you today that uh, just over 1.747 was raised by the church, placing that in the top five of all time that, that had happened in the life of the church. It was a very good um, uh, December for us. Uh, and uh, a very uh, amazing time. And so we finished the year in a very, very strong financial position. Um, we, we actually are starting with a cash reserve on hand. That does not mean we don't need generosity. Uh, what we have learned is we don't know what any year has ahead for us. And so we're wanting to, to do some things, but we are very excited about that strong financial position, all these families joining the church. And did I mention Ogdos? So what is Ogdos, you may say? It is one great day of service. Now, some of you are sitting there saying, now, Pastor Brad, I don't know what I can do. Oh, but that's okay. I don't even know what you can do necessarily, but I got people thinking stuff up for us to do. You can click on there. I can help in some way, but I'm not sure. Uh, you can go to our website, site, register for Ogdos. You can have your friends register. You do not have to be a member of this church to make a difference or do something. You don't even have to show up on that Saturday. Right Now, if you sign up for one of the events on that Saturday, you have to be here for that. But there are things you can do. Our goal is to do something that we had done uh, several years back where we had a 1,000 people participate in Ogdos. Even back then, a 1,000 people weren't here on that day, but a 1,000 people did things in the run-up and into the actual event of that day. So we want to do that again because it's an amazing goal to have and to help the church get back into what we've been, where mission is the heart of who we are as we try to live into what this new world looks like in a, in a kind of world with COVID. So we're trying to do that well. There are ways to participate. I encourage you to go to the website and get signed up for that. It's mdumc.org slash ogdos, okay? But um, if you see me smiling all day, those are why I'm smiling. I'm just uh, very happy. The other reason I'm smiling is Luke chapters four and five are my favorite chapters of the Bible. <laughs> so now y'all are laughing, right? I said that the first time in my sermon, everybody just stared at me when I said, but, but yeah, yeah. Um, and it is uh, amazing. Um, I, I think you'll find it to be uh, quite a blessing to you. And I really hope today uh, this kind of examination of the early ministry of Luke and um, the way in which Luke tells the story to help communicate us uh, to us the insights that Luke had learned about God, I, I think are going to be very helpful uh, to us all. So uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, the challenge I'll have is just time. So I'll go as fast and far as I can. I will stay after and answer questions. Uh, somebody asked me last week when a few people got up at time and headed out, uh, was I upset about that? Or, no, no, no. Y'all are all adults. If you ever need to get up, go get, go to the bathroom, go to the cup of coffee. Unless you say, Pastor Brad, I'm mad at you. I, I don't think you're mad at me. I don't try to think for you. We're all adults. Do, do what your body needs. Do what you need. Uh, I'm going to stay and answer questions uh, for those that need that. Also, too, if you need to email me between times, if you have more questions from our talk, uh, always feel free to do that. I'll get to them in order as soon as I can, but I do try to get all those answered by the weekend, okay, uh, just to let you know. Well, as is our tradition, let's go ahead and open with prayer, and we'll begin there. 
God of grace, God of mercy, and God of love, we thank you for the blessing of Jesus, for your Son made flesh who dwelled among us, who lived in our lives, who was tempted as we seem to be every day, who lived in such a way that he redeemed each one of us, that his love, mercy, and grace might be known, that he sought us out and went beyond our inability to pay attention, our inability to care, our inability to observe, our obstinance, our pettiness, our, oh, this is the only way something can happen, and broke down every barrier and wall to grace. God, you love every person here And every person who can hear my voice, either now or as they listen to this recording, bless them eternally with a deeper understanding and a heart knowledge of your love and grace for them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. How do you start better than chapter 4 of Luke? Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, isn't that amazing? Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit, okay? You know something good is going on, right? You have the divinity of God fully revealed because Jesus has been filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're told here in chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. Why was Jesus down at the Jordan? To be baptized, right? And remember in Luke's account, there's that little thing of John the Baptist was already in jail. And some people said, Pastor Brad, are you saying that John the Baptist didn't really baptize Jesus? I'm saying, no, that's not what I said. I said, just Luke just has him in jail. Like, deal with it, you know, like it's in the Bible, you know, we, we kind of have to wrestle with that, all right? So just why is that, okay? The divinity, though, of the Holy Spirit for Luke is what's the key to the baptism of Jesus. No human is the key to what's going on in Jesus. So I know some people were disrupted by that last week. Don't let it, like I said, don't let it kill your faith or not. I'm just saying, when you look at Luke, for Luke, what's important is the Holy Spirit in the baptism of Jesus. And in fact, in Luke's account, you get the voice, you get the Father, and you get the Spirit, right? Which is back to the creation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit present, right? The Word, which is Jesus, right? You get the Father, the creating God, and then the Spirit, the Ruach Elohim, the the Spirit of God over the deeps. You get all those together. So here, that's you get this scene again where you have now just the Spirit with Jesus, okay? He's led by the Spirit into the wilderness, right? Which is not how I want to see this. I don't want to see the Spirit taking Jesus to the temptation. Even worse, the temptation is the little bad dude. It's the devil, right? Now, some of you have learned a lot about the devil through the years, and um, some by practical experience, but others uh, by biblical teaching, by people who will teach about like Hasatan and this idea of this tempter or this kind of thing. The Greek here, though, is actual Diablo, which means devil. This is not um, adversary. This is actually right? The embodiment of the spiritual powers of wickedness that is trying to thwart the good purposes of God, all right? Now, you don't have to put it like a pitchfork in his hand or think of a guy with pointy horns, uh, but this is evil, the embodiment of evil, okay? That, that's what this is talking about. And you can't really, I mean, you may try to look at Luke. Again, uh, uh, you know, we can talk about factuality. I'm just saying, enter the world of Luke with me, right? That's the goal here. We're going to enter Luke's world, in, in Luke's world, you don't get a gospel without Jesus conquering the devil and the, the demons and the archdemons, okay? They're all over the text. So you're going to have a problem if, if you don't have a, a way to work that into your understanding of God and, and how the, the, the kind of the world works, right? And I would argue it's going to be necessary. 
okay? There's a great book, if you, if you want to read it, by um, a guy named Edwin Lewis. Uh, he's probably the only good Methodist theologian, oh, I don't know, ever, of the 20th century. And he's got a chapter called The Spindle of Necessity. And he talks about if we're really monotheist, we have a problem in that there has to be something working against the goodwill of God, or we can't explain all the evil that exists in the world. All right, it was written in 1926. It's a really good work. I would commend it. Um, but uh, it kind of gets at this issue. Uh, so if you have a problem with that theologically or understanding it in your God view, you know, just know it. For Luke, Luke doesn't have any problem with that, and it's just there. The devil just pops onto the page all of a sudden. And, and in fact, um, our Gospels, almost all of them, Matthew, Mark, and Luke for sure, can really be seen as a battle between Jesus and the devil up until the crucifixion where Jesus wins. Um, that's not a, a wrong way to read the text. So uh, here we are in uh, this uh, chapter four, verse one, the Holy Spirit, but I don't like that image, but it's there, right? So the Holy Spirit is literally pushing Jesus, leading Jesus toward the devil. And here in Luke's account, we get something different in verse two. In Luke's account, it's about hunger. He was famished, right? In Matthew and Mark's account, remember, Jesus has spiritually prepared himself through the practice of fasting, right? But Luke is making a different point. And it's a point that if you think about it, makes sense out of practicality. When are you most tempted? Are you most tempted early in the morning when you wake up happy and everything's good? Uh, your children have just told you they love you, and they're all shiny and bright and ready to go, and you're smiling and well-fed, and you had your second cup of coffee and are happy, right? Your spouse had just told you they loved you, and they're so happy that they chose you out of all the people in the world, right? I mean, that's when you're tempted, right? Right? No, when do you get tempted? When you're tired, when you're exhausted, when you're hungry, when the appetites of your body take control and your medulla oblongata here in the back is ruling how you behave and the higher functions stop, right? That's when you get, that's when you get tired and get tempted, right? So that's what's going on there. And we're told he was famished, and the devil said to him, if you were the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. What's wrong with that? Dude, you're Jesus. You're the dude. Come on, you're hungry. Get that. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Isn't he going to do that at some point? Aren't there going to be a whole bunch of people in a field? Mm -hmm. What? How many loaves? How many fishes? What? Okay, but I'm just saying, he's going to do the feeding miracle, right? But you're right, that was not a temptation, that was a different exhibit of power for purpose, right? He's famished. If you were son of the God, there, the devil's wily, though, it seems reasonable, right? But Jesus responds, and here on the next slide, I put it up here for you. I just wanted to give you kind of the order. Um, you know, one of the things I'll try to point out to you in this, you, you know the pattern here. Um, the, the Greeks had a kind of understanding of this text, and the people of the time, it, it really, it, it's, I'm sorry, I said Greeks. I meant the, the first century Jewish tradition that, that there, was a, there was kind of a, a love of pleasure, a love of possessions, a love of glory, and that these were the vices of, of most people that would get them in trouble. And Luke puts this in an order that the traditional understanding would kind of take on uh, that that this love and, and love of pleasure. It's it, the Greek doesn't really translate. It means the needs of the body or the flesh. It, it doesn't literally mean like lust or hunger, or, but it means those. It's all of those things. It's it's not one of those things. It just means the appetites of the body. Um, that, that what your body yearns for, an ability to overcome that mentally, um, that we have to overcome. And the, the word love, we, we use it so many different ways. It means being ruled by that, right? If you're ruled by what your body needs, you have a problem, right? 
Um, if you're ruled by what you think your eyes see, that you need to, to always get the next thing and conquer things, that that's a, that's a character flaw. Uh, that if you love glory and recognition and everyone knowing your name, that's a flaw, right? And so for the, the, the ancients, they had this kind of view that was consistent. And what people through the years, the classics uh, have pointed out is that, that these three you know, address that. And I just wanted to show you that, just no extra charge. It's just up there to kind of frame it. Um, you get the temptation here. I, I think most of you know the story. It, it's kind of a fun one to tell. Um, the, the thing I would say, there's always conversation about the pinnacle uh, and the, the kind of what happens there at, at the end. And um, there's a couple of possibilities. Um, there was the Anatolia Fortress. There's some debate about where that was, if it was, abs if it was in the corner of the Temple Mount and it was up high, so there would have been a tower on top of the current corner of the Temple Mount, and that would be there. But just so you know, the corner of the Temple Mount comes into the Kidron Valley, and when you go there with me, you'll see that it's about 100 meters. That's about uh, 300 feet up above uh, the bottom of the Kidron Valley. If you were to be thrown off of that, uh, you're going to be hurting, right? Probably die. Um, so whether it was the pinnacle, meaning that brow of that, of that, what we see today, or if it was on a tower above that, either either way is bad, okay? Uh, let me answer, write down questions. Let me go all the way to the end. I'm on a time crunch, but I'll answer every single question. Um, but all those things kind of fold there. Um, and then we get down to this really interesting verse at the end, right? And because I, I've, I've, uh, I would commend my sermon on this uh, where I did a different thing. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll say this one thing about it. And that is, don't, um, don't make them the temptations of Brad, right? Right, don't make them your temptations, right? Remember, what do we do when our temptations and our temptations, when we're tempted by the devil, we go to Jesus. We don't try to fix it ourselves. We go to the supernatural power that can help us overcome all that we face. That's where we tend to get it wrong. We think sometimes we're God. That's our greatest sin. So anyway, that's there. Um, here at verse 13, uh, we'll get down to when the devil had finished every test, he departed from uh, him until an opportune time. Uh, Jesus will answer everything with scripture. I do want to point out to you here that in the last temptation, um, you remember the devil does use scripture a little bit. He just uses it incorrectly. Yes. And of course, we've never known somebody who used scripture incorrectly to try to make their point, right? Yeah. All right. Next slide. Great. So, um, so then what's fascinating is that then uh, Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report around him spread through all uh, the surrounding country. And uh, basically, Jesus goes back home. And for the last two weeks, we've kind of uh, preached and taught about this. Um, but this report is that he began to teach in verse 15. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Okay, so at this point, he's being praised for his what? Teaching, right? It doesn't say, though, that he's doing a lot of he healing miracles yet. Um, and so because the people at Nazareth tend to have an expectation of healing uh, in the next text, people often wonder, what's up with that? Like, is something missing or is there a, a pre-report? I, I would just go back to what we said early on. Remember that sometimes as we look at Luke, Luke is putting things in an order for a purpose of theology and helping us understand something about God not necessarily uh, sequentially, okay? And I'll make this point really intentionally when I get to the middle of chapter five, okay? Uh, you'll see this very clearly. But here um, we get in verse 14, now we're in 414, we get Jesus going back uh, to Nazareth. I put a picture here that you can't hardly see behind me, but I hope you can see on the slides in front of you or on the slides you have at home. Uh, it is actually a picture that uh, about 10 years ago, at least, was behind the altar 
at the Crusader Church that is in, uh, supposed to be on top of where the synagogue was uh, that Jesus was doing all this in. And it's a picture of Jesus there teaching in the synagogues of the region, which is really kind of cool, okay? It's from the ninth century, so it's much after the text was written, but it's still, for a Texas boy, that was still pretty, pretty old, okay? I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, but um, the thing you'll notice in it is what is Jesus doing while he's preaching? He's sitting. If you don't learn anything else uh, from this time together, please learn that Jesus, primarily when he spoke authoritatively, sat. It's an important kind of component to authoritative teaching in Jesus's time. All right. So what we have here is we have the, the scroll and Jesus talking with it. He began to pre. Uh, to teach in their synagogue. And then verse 16, he comes to Nazareth. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. Okay, it's his custom to go to the synagogue. What was also the custom is that when someone returned home, they would ask the, and again, I, and I'm so sorry, this is the culture of the time, not Pastor Brad advocating for anything, okay? The culture of the time was when a man returned home, he would be asked to read. Okay, uh, and so he was asked to read. The scroll, um, if rolled out, I've seen the scroll of Isaiah from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it would cover about uh, from that, that first stained glass window past the third one almost to the fourth. Okay, it's, it's big, all right? It would weigh about 50 pounds, all right? So when he has to hand it back to the attendant, like that's no, I mean, it's a bit, it's a big thing. And when he finds a place that there's, there's a physicality to that, that can be kind of underestimated when you read it, when we're not familiar with the context, he reads Isaiah. The thing I want to point out to you is that what he reads in Isaiah is kind of Isaiah a little bit. It's not exactly the passage in Isaiah. There's a few adjustments, right? So um, he's missing to bind up the brokenhearted from Isaiah 61.1. He adds from Isaiah 58.6 to let the oppressed go free. Uh, yet those in the synagogue by verse 22, though, after that reading are amazed, uh, you know, are, are, are amazed by the gracious words. They, they uh, find those words to be full of, of grace, right? And they, they wonder, is not this Joseph's son? Okay, now, so, that, so that's interesting. So some people's theory is that Luke has these other books in front of them. Uh, I, I don't know that I buy that. I, I think that Luke is working from memory some as he's writing these things down. Uh, I just want you to know, I don't think it was Jesus's mistake in his reading, right? I also don't, I don't, don't think Jesus was trying to editorialize. I, I think Luke was uh, you know, just going from memory and writing down what he remembered. Okay. So that's there. I like the adjustments. I don't have any problem with them, but I'm just saying when you go back, it's kind of fun to read all of 61. Uh, as we, uh, go back to it here, uh, is this not Joseph's son? Uh, then we get this interesting thing that's a little bit different. He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, do you hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard? But we know is what else did he do in Capernaum? Healings, right? So that's what they said. And also, too, he references what? Physicians, doctors, right? So, uh, and he says to them, and here, this is where the NRSV is superior to other, to others, right? The word in Hebrew, and I, I know people um, here uh, sometimes will use amen to say, may it be so, or kind of future hopeful tense. The word amen means true. May it be true, or may it be, it, it has that implication of truth to it. Uh, when, when we say amen after something, it means truth, truth. Uh, you're saying true, true. Uh, uh, it's an aff affirmation. There, there is that element to it. So may it be so is, is good. You're hoping it will be true. It will become reality. Um, but, but when people say it, 
Uh, it also in Hebrew, it, it has that, that connotation to it. And, and what you'll count here is, is look at verse 24, uh, and it goes through here. There's a couple of truly, truly, like, and I don't know about you, but truth, when um, Jesus says, and it's in red letter, truth, truth, I'm telling you the truth, like, I, I kind of pay attention, right? How about y'all? Anybody else kind of like have, oh, okay, all right, God, uh, let's, let's hear what's saying. And so here, getting this point across, um, it's an odd point. Um, it's not necessarily what I would have thought would happen, right? So let's go to the next slide. All's good, but now he's going to get rejected. He, he, he says, let me tell you the real truth about what's going on. He says, there's a widow at Zarephath in the time of Elijah that received relief, right? He's making a reference back to 1 Kings 17, all right? So if, if you remember, 1 Kings 17 tells of this widow and specifically of Elijah. And I, I think I shared on, on Sunday, so I don't mean to be overly repetitious, but about Elijah hiding in a wadi, hiding out there. And um, a wadi is a rocky kind of cavern or cliffs where a creek can run and where water's there sometime. But, it, you know, the issue is, uh, you know, friends, there had been no rain for, we're told, three and a half years. Everything had dried up and he's hiding out there. God had anointed these ravens to bring him uh, food, and so he's getting water from the bottom of the wadi, uh, and hopefully a little, a little spring, and he's getting the food from the ravens, and then uh, that dries up, and then he pleads with God, who sends him to a widow up in Lebanon in Tyre to the Phoenicians. Like it's, I, I mean, I, I just, I can't even this is the holiest of holy dudes in Israel having to go to the Phoenicians, who are the least holy of anybody. Now, if you're of Phoenician descent, there's no offense in that. I, I don't, they, they came good after Jesus, but like, oh my, and he's got to go beg from a widow. Like, that's crazy. And she's on her last little bit of flour and oil, right? And he pleads and he makes a bargain with her. And her first answer was no. And then finally she says yes and has pity. And God uses that little bit of pity to transform the world. But Jesus' point isn't that God still shows up and performs a miracle when people are desperate. God's point is, there were widows all over Israel, and they died. That's the truth. Well, gee, thanks, Jesus. What? And y'all think some of my young preachers get carried away. My goodness. Wow. And then to make matters worse, he doubles down on it. Okay, how many of y'all are here when I did Jonah, right? And when I said Assyrians, what did you do, right? I mean, Naaman is an Assyrian. Oh, my. He's the baddest of the bad. If he has leprosy, let him die. Thank God. God is finally smiting him as he should. He's getting what he deserves. That's the faithful response, right? Right? Elisha says, send them to me, I'll help. You got to go wash in the river seven times. And it's his servants that talk him into finally doing it. Now, the part I didn't tell on Sunday, because I didn't want to get run up to the brow. I don't know where y'all would, maybe the trash mound down off of the South Beltway, y'all could take me up there and throw me off or whatever. One of the buildings downtown was, what if Jesus kept going in 15 and referenced the greed of Gehazi? Y'all know about Gehazi? So after Elisha does this healing, all right, Na Naaman is so impressed that Naaman comes back to Elijah and says, let me give you something for what you've done. 
And Elijah says, no. No, I did what God told me to do. And that's enough. And so Naaman goes, okay, and goes on, right? Gehazi is like terrified by that. Dude, come on. And so he comes up with an idea that he'll go say, hey, the prophet just had a couple of people drop in and we need a couple of bags of silver and a couple of other things and a couple of meals and a couple of things. And then he goes and does that, All right? And it comes back to Elijah. And Elijah says, you now have Naaman's curse. And the leprosy breaks out on Gehazi. Why did they want to throw him off the cliff? Right? Because for them, they weren't just thinking about Naaman. They were also thinking about Gehazi. They knew the story that we didn't. And it's all of it together that leads to this response. Jesus is saying, okay, the truth is you have turned my father's house. You're going to hear it later. You've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. You are profiting by lies instead of helping people encounter the faith that can transform their lives. You're buying and selling something instead of sharing the love that God intended. And they hate him for it. They should. So anyway, I get kind of preachy. I get kind of excited about this stuff. Didn't I tell you these are great stories? They're the best, right? But there's a reason uh, that he does that. He's still filled with the Holy Spirit. So of course, they drive him to the cliff. I said, spoiler alert, Jesus is going to pass right through him. They can't touch him, okay? Because again, he's been there. There's another part before we leave this kind of synagogue scene that, that I want to, I don't think we do enough with. And, and that's the whole what does Jesus mean when he says anointed? And what did Isaiah mean when Isaiah said anointed, right? So just to be clear about that, Isaiah, when Isaiah says, I, God has anointed me to do this, he is talking about the one who is to come, right? And uh, the, the, you know, he's talking future about who will be here. They will say these things. Then when Jesus says the word is fulfilled, Jesus is claiming those things. So not only is J Jesus in the saying, this has been fulfilled, he is making clear that he is the Messiah, right? Because all the word Messiah means is the one anointed by God, right? The anointed one. He's making clear, he's making a claim, I am the Messiah. He makes that claim in their presence. Where they're, and they're like, woohoo, we're going to get healed, right? And then the part they don't want is, what we know in this class already, because we've read Hosea, right? Part of what the Messiah does is proclaim the truth. They don't want the amen. Amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Right? You get about four of them in there. True, 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 true. Right? All right. So we kind of go there, okay? But he goes on his way. Now he goes down to Capernaum in verse 31, and we get like, about, how many of y'all ever, do y does anybody remember the old movie, the, the Longest Day? It had like everybody in Hollywood in it. It was retelling the D-Day invasion story, and it's got all these cameos by every people, okay? I know we love that as the longest day, but I pretty much assure you that, that this was the longest day, okay? Because you're going to see like, boom, 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 boom. There's a lot of scenes that are going to happen right here. So it starts here. Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city in Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath, right? As was his custom, right? Jesus is actually, I don't know, kind of the rabbi of Capernaum. That's his job, right? Uh, they were astounded at his teaching because he spoke with authority. Very fascinating. In the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. 
I saw in verse 33. And he cried out with a loud voice, let us alone. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. All right. For Luke and the people reading Luke, this is incredibly important, right? The demons know who Jesus is. They get it. They know what's up, right? In verse 35, but Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down before them, he came out of him without having done him any harm. Thank goodness, right? And in verse 36, they were all amazed and kept saying to one another, what kind of utterance is this? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and out they come. And a report about him began to reach every place in the region. Yeah, right. Obviously, not only is he teaching with authority, now he's casting out demons with authority. People talk, friends. I don't know if you've noticed, right? So, so the word is going to spread. All right, let's go to the, the next, next uh, slide. And so now, after leaving the synagogue, he goes, entered Simon Peter's house, right? Y'all know Simon, right, Peter? Right, you've heard of him right? Right? The dude who will be at the pearly gates, right? Has anybody ever heard a, cho a, a joke about St. Peter? Right? How many? Yeah, everybody, right? So, St. Peter, uh, I mean, that guy, right? This is his mother-in-law, right? She has a fever. So, Jesus goes to his house, right? Literally, we believe that Jesus, for his temporal ministry, his ministry on earth, the headquarters, the base was Simon Peter's home where his mother-in-law lived. They would sleep on the roof, and they lived in this little house, and that's where they operated out of uh, as they had their ministry in Galilee for those first couple of years, where we get the kind of, I wish there was significantly more description in Luke, uh, but that's where, where we got, right? So after leaving the synagogue, right, same day, he entered the, Simon Peter's house. Now, she was uh, suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her, then he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Immediately he got up and began to serve them. She got up and began to serve them, right? Um, and uh, here, please, uh, that's an incredibly sexist comment these days. My daughter would be up here hat pulling me aside saying, Dad, what are you saying? And I just want, for that culture and time, that was a really good thing that she was then able to serve, Okay. Um, so, but uh, again, we think differently about people's roles in the household. They could have, those boys could have helped themselves to some things out of their fridge and got their own drinks. I understand that. All right. Just for the record. Uh, but, um, but here it's important that all that is still happening in the same day. Okay. And now as the sun is setting, all those who had any who were sick with various kinds of diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on each of them and cured them, right? A theme you're going to see in the gospel is Jesus always tends to be filled with compassion. Demons also came out of many shouting, you are the son of God, right? So that one demon in the morning, there are many more that get cast out and people, you know, hear that they, these demons as they're going out know who Jesus is. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Messiah or the anointed one. Then verse 42, at daybreak, he departed and went, oh, hold on, uh, you're saying, oh yeah, but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, right? At daybreak, he departed and went into a deserted place and the crowds uh, were looking for him. Right, so this is daybreak. This is kind of late. The crowds are searching for him, and when they reached him, they wanted to prevent him for, from leaving. But he said to them, "I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. There's more for me to do." So he continued proclaiming the message in the synagogues of Judea. Right, so I'm not just going here; I'm to go to all the cities. But I mean, it's so much so that all the people are crowding in on him that when he's like, okay, guys, I got to go. No, 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 no. They won't let him leave, right? So it's, it's a very fascinating scene. I want to show you a few pictures. 
uh, Capernaum. Uh, love, love the place. Uh, what you'll notice here in, in a couple of the pictures, you'll notice the black stone. It's a very poor town. Uh, you, you'll, you'll contrast it with other places you go that have the Roman marble, other first century towns that were more wealthy and affluent, had plumbing and those kind of things. Capernaum's not like that. Uh, it's built out of uh, kind of the, the dark stone that was around them. It was a fishing village, very small hamlet, a small little town, and very poor, okay? Um, you you kind of get the, the kind of the, the run here. We did that. Always going to be trouble uh, with crowds. Uh, you're going to see this be, become a theme in Luke. The crowds and the disciples are going to have a, a real issue with kind of understanding. They don't tend to get it. All right, next slide. This here, uh, and I hope you see it better in the picture in front of you or on your computer, but uh, if you look up here, um, <laughs> that's the house. Uh, it's, it's just a little bit bigger than this stage up here is. It's not very big. Remember, ancient, like we, we build mansions in Texas uh, by any other standard in the world. Most, most homes around the world are not very big. Um, even our smaller homes are, are massive. Uh, that that, that uh, home there out of the stone is, is very, very small. Uh, it, might be, it might be one and a half of the stage. And what they decided to do, uh, I wish they hadn't, back in sometime around the 50s, uh, somebody came up with this idea of building a church over the top of that home. And it looks like a UFO landed on it. It's horrible. It looks like something out of one of the James Bond movies where they've got the the thing with the legs out and it's hovering over the middle and all that. Uh, it's cool because you can walk over and see down, but architecturally they could have done something that I don't know, looked like it was from Capernaum, you know, like it was just a, a disaster, uh, but somebody got a lot of money to do it. Probably somebody, you know, anyway, uh, but, um, but, but there it is. And I just, I thought it was beautiful. Uh, the pictures I took down through the glass and the bottom didn't come out very well. It's a dirt floor too. So it's just, there's not a lot there. Uh, now, but um, they say that's the place. So, um, and they have for a long time. So it's 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 pretty. You're in the neighborhood, pretty close. All right. Next slide. Right. Um, this next story is is is. I don't know. It's it's got to be close to my favorite. I mean, really, really close. Um, this is me at the Sea of Galilee on a rocky shore, and yes, as I'm describing this story to you, I'm literally seeing that shore. The thing to remember about the Sea of Galilee is it is not a Texas beach. It is not flat. It's not a Texas lake with a little shallow. It's a good steep, there's like a, there's like a natural amphitheater there, okay? It's got, it's got a little up to it right as you come out of the water. So when you're on the, right there on, on the Sea of Galilee, now some of you will say, but Pastor Brad, it says the Lake of Genesaret, right? That is the Hebrew name for the Sea of Galilee, same body of water, okay? But when you're right there by Capernaum, there's a place where un, to this day, uh, you can still see where the fishermen are going in and out of. It's very likely if you're not actually at the spot, you're in the neighborhood, you know, pretty close. You can get a feel for it. And there's a beach that would fit kind of in this room, okay? And you can see the soil behind me. You see how it has rocks with just a little bit of sandy in it? It's much more like that. And so imagine there in that spot, um, you have um, people pressing up against Jesus to hear the word of God proclaimed. Okay. Now, why would they be there? Part of why they would be there is because it goes up and down this kind of area where there was a ma massive corridor or transportation hub that ran kind of north and south up the great rift valley that came right through Tiberias and then goes on the other side of the mountain right? So it doesn't go against the Sea of Galilee. It goes kind of on the inland side to go up toward Damascus and around, okay? But you would come over to Tiberias, which is just down the lake, just a few miles down the road. It'd be like go, going from here out to Katy, okay? Um, just down the way, um, because they have natural hot springs there, okay? They got healing muds and healing things, right? So imagine... If you're on I-10 out in Katy 
and you had you were at uh, uh, Houston Methodist West to get treated, and the treatment wasn't working. But you heard some, that there was some somebody who had a new treatment in I don't know uh, Waller or Richmond. Like, would you make the trip to go check it out before you drove all the way back to Chicago, right? I mean, or something like that. Or I mean, of course, they were walking. Yeah. So Jesus did a few healings. He wakes up the next morning, and what's happened? Everybody's there, okay? If you want to know this, uh, so we did a vacation Bible school down in Haiti one time, and we were there, and um, the first day we had 150 kids, and we gave out these little uh, things for them to have that were made out of wood, these beautiful little toys, like some of the things we do here. The next day we had 600, like we woke up and it's like, here they came. I mean, that's the kind of thing you're talking about here. There was something that just the people had to have, and there they were. They're all pressing up against him, okay? Now, did I mention, all right, Jesus had slept in the fisherman's house. He had done a healing in their home. He had done a healing and casting out a demon in their synagogue, right? Remember all this? Like all this has happened, right? I'm not making this stuff up, right? All that's happened, right? So now a crowd has showed up and is pressing down on Jesus. And here in the beginning of chapter five, what are we told that the fishermen are doing while Jesus is teaching the crowd? What? They're fishing. Are you kidding me? They're fishing. They're doing what they've always done. Right? Have you ever been too busy? Have you ever been distracted? I'll, I won't. I'm sorry. I'll preach Sunday. This is the text for Sunday. All right. If that's not enough, Jesus sees that they're washing their nets now because they've been fishing all night, he hops in one of the empty boats. How do you think the lake folk fishermen who did this for a living felt about pretty mountain boy who came down and taught in the synagogues and stayed on shore all day hopping in one of their boats? I mean, do you think they were happy about that? Right? I, I can imagine Simon Peter's look at him like, what now? Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? Oh, my God, literally, right? I mean, I, and then they're looking at him. It's like, okay, okay. Well, he did heal, he did heal my mother-in-law. Okay, I kind of like her. All right. And I, I really like my mother-in-law, but, you know, some people don't. And it's like, okay, so... All right, yeah, we'll, we'll push you out. All right, so let's push him out. So they push him out. Well, then what does Jesus do? He sits down and keeps teaching. How long did he teach? Was it 15 minutes? Was it all morning? Was it a couple of hours? We, we don't know. But he went ahead and taught. And what does he have there? He has a natural amphitheater where everyone can hear his voice easily. And he teaches them the word of God. It's a beautiful scene. But those fishermen are just probably beside themselves. And then, if that wasn't enough, they were kind enough to stop their busy work, providing for their families and doing their jobs to help this guy out, then Mountain Boy has the nerve to tell them how to fish. Can you imagine the indignity of that? We're told after he's done, hey, Simon Peter, dude, why don't you throw it out in that deep water over there? Simon's response is kind of funny. Um, it, it, the English translation just doesn't even really do it justice. It's this, Master, we've worked all night. But if you say so, I mean, it's exasperated. It, it's, not, it's not a, oh, yes, Master, we love you and we do that. Because if not, you don't understand why he responds the way he does later, 
right? I mean, he, he's at wit's end. But the great thing about Peter, even when at wit's end, what does he do? He does it. He does it. And he lets down his nets. The nets are so heavy, they can't even begin to pull in the fish. They have to call over another boat. They didn't need one boat. They had to have two boats. And the second boat also almost sank because there were so many fish. And then when Jesus had met the need that had kept them away from God, Simon Peter falls down and confesses the truth. I'm a sinful man. I don't deserve all this. Hmm. You know, the ancients had a tradition where they would go um, in a sanctuary space and they would just lay down prostrate just on the ground, just praising God and thanking God for the joy of the blessings in their lives. Mm. Keenly aware of their own shortcomings, the humility before God. I, I love that story because I don't know about you, but it, we live in a distracted world. And isn't it amazing to know that even when we get distracted, even when we get lost, God chases us and finds us in ways that we'll understand and know so that we might come back home and to know the love in God. And I see it's then that they put down everything and follow Jesus. Now, the problem for us is in all the other call stories and the other things of all the disciples, the way it reads is Jesus walks up to them, follow me, and what do they do? They leave everything and follow, right? But the reason we get this story is because mama knew how they had mistreated her boy. Did you remember when I told you that Mary is the source on a lot of this material? Mamas don't forget when you diss their sons, and we get this amazing story, but I think the story is salvific. Because if you've ever been in a situation where you felt like you forgot God for a bit, or you've been too busy, God's still looking for you and will meet you where you are and will find you in a way that will bring you back home, right? And then we contrast that with here in verse 29, Levi. He goes up to Levi. Well, and right before that, I guess it's really 27, right? He goes to Levi, the tax collector, follow me. And Levi, in verse 28, he got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi gives a great banquet, right? Right, and then uh, there's the, the fun part, and I warned you, and I'll, I'll close with this real quick as we kind of read the end. There's a, there's a little bit more, but there's Levi... There's also one other healing in here, and it might have been right before that. There's the paralytic. Yeah, there's too much. I'm going to jump back and probably finish some of this. I get carried away on that one. Let's go back to verse 12 before I get to Levi. In contrast, I'll do this, and I'll probably pick up at 17 next week. Is it already that time? Man, y'all let me get carried away. Was it worth it, though? Do y'all like going deep on it? Is it okay? I love, again, did I mention it's one of my favorite chapters in my favorite book of the Bible? Yeah. Uh, as we kind of get back there to verse 12, let, let's just take a good look at that one. Um, as I look at that, um, remember when I said that um, Luke isn't really overly concerned about the historicity that we worry about? Just read this with me. Verse 12, once when he was in one of the cities, there was a man covered with leprosy. You remember that time by the place with the thing where we got the stuff and our friends? Like, help a brother out here, Luke. Like, what? 
And yet uh, Jesus will heal this man. It's a, a very touching uh, story because uh, the man's faith is um, the unnamed man uh, is often what he's called. Uh, the unnamed man uh, has this abundant faith that says, you can heal me if you choose. And Jesus says, I do choose. And he reaches out and touches the man. And the man's instantly made clean. And he said, tell no one. But then he says, but go tell the priest and show yourself to do the offering that you're supposed to by the law. And, but, but here's the deal. When he does, that's what gets Jesus in trouble with the feds. Okay. That, that's, that's when all heck comes down on him. Because when you start attracting crowds and when you do something that the priests think they should be doing, you're going to get people mad. When you, when, you, when you hit at their livelihood, they don't take too kindly to that, right? And so what's going to happen is now, after this, when we get to 17, you're going to see that there are going to be teachers and Pharisees and scribes and a whole group all, uh, all there to watch what Jesus is saying, what he's doing, asking questions, and the whole tenor of everything changes. So was it when he was doing things in the synagogue up in Capernaum, or sorry, up in Nazareth, when it's when he get the longest day in Capernaum, or is it in these teachings afterwards? Is it the no-name man? Is it the fish? What attracts it? Is it all of these reports that are going out and they feel like finally they have to do something? The answer is probably yes. But if I was going to have to say, what's the straw, it's when Jesus sends a known leper back to the temple clean that the, the people from Jerusalem have got to come down and check this out, right? And it's not a short distance, right? What did we say? It's about a 31-hour walk. Jerusalem's a little bit closer, so you're probably saying about 25 hours of walking. So that's about a three- to four-day journey for a priest. They were kind of lazy back then, you know? So just saying. All right, friends, I will answer questions now. And again, I'm, I, I get kind of carried away. Uh, we will, though, uh, I just think uh, that the man on the mat, uh, especially the theology of it, what it says, too, about infant baptism is so important that we'll stop and uh, take that up. So I've already got some of, your, some of these slides you'll see again next week. Any questions? Yeah, Peggy. Yeah. So Pe Peggy said she liked uh, it in uh, chapter five there in the middle with the unknown man, that last line, Jesus often withdrew by himself to pray. Yeah, I, I think it's an essential uh, practice for anyone spiritual. There's a real importance of uh, having that time to be communing with God directly. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Peggy. Beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Right. So uh, Linda asked, for those on Zoom, uh, Linda asked a great question about um, if Jesus had made the bread would he have been sinning at all? Would he have been sinning because he had done what Jesus, uh, sorry, what Satan said, or or what what all there? Um, great question, Linda. I don't know. <laughs> I am I am glad he didn't. Uh, I'm glad he answered uh, with uh, Jesus as the uh, enfleshment of the Word of God. I'm glad Jesus answered as the Word of God, authoritatively. Jesus answered, we do not live by bread alone. And he took the bodily need and transformed it into a spiritual truth. And um, I think it only crystallizes Jesus as fully human, fully divine. And um, uh, for me, that's good enough. And uh, I'll let Jesus decide uh, if Jesus would have sinned if Jesus had chosen to do something different. Uh, I'm not going to dare to pronounce... Uh, anything of Jesus as sin or not. 
Uh, I know Jesus was without sin, and that's good enough for me. Yeah. Yeah, Robbie. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so Robbie asked a great question. Why doesn't Jesus want the demons to proclaim who he is? Why, why does he want them silenced? And, and I would add to that, why doesn't he want other people uh, proclaiming that? So in, in Luke, uh, there's kind of a sequencing of timing. And there is a time after the transfiguration where it is right and proper for people to then know who Jesus is fully as the Messiah, and for Jesus to share that information. Until then, it is not the time in Luke's account of the, the, the story. Uh, so for Luke, that's going to be an important thing, but that is something that has bothered people for decades, and it's often asked, why doesn't Jesus want people to know? It's really because for Luke, until you get to the center point of, of the gospel, which is the transfiguration, which is that full clarity. You get, you get these previews, these foretastes of who Jesus is. And the cool thing is, is we are in on it. Like we know, right? Uh, but, but, but for, for Jesus, it's not time until after the transfiguration says, now it's time. And literally from the transfiguration to the cross, it's all to Jerusalem and the cross. Uh, so it's very, it's very interesting. There's this kind of before matter that's really about the nature of, and, and I'm going to say this, please don't misunderstand this. I'm not saying that Jesus wasn't involved in all these things, but the reason we have it this way is because we are to be doing all these things as people of God, right? So like, it's for us and our faith, right? To the transfiguration, to only the things Jesus can do, then you get this kind of healing of the world and this outpouring of the Spirit through Jesus and the resurrection that then leads to Acts, because remember Acts is after it, that then moves in a first section of the direct uh, apostles. Then you get Paul at like a new transfiguration that then sweeps through the world. And, and that's, if, you, if I had to summarize Luke Acts, that's the movement of, yeah. Yep. It has been fulfilled. Yeah, so at home, he kind of, uh, yeah, Robbie pointed out at home, he, uh, he says, though, uh, it has been fulfilled, the, you know, this text has been fulfilled in your reading, and that text says, I am the Messiah, right? So why wouldn't he want the world to know? That's, that's a really great question. I really wish Luke was here to ask him. Uh, uh, but uh, but the rest of the text, he's very clear. Maybe he thinks that because it's not time yet, um, they're going to try to throw him off the cliff again, and it's not time for that. You know, I don't know. Um, but um, I, I just think that the problem that 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 text, I don't know. Like, I, I had to say, there's a there's a there's a fun there's a fun uh, book I might write one time. It would be like faithful faithful uh, mysteries or questions from the Bible. Like, like you know, because because there's there's another part too. Like like in uh, Mark's accounts, uh, you know, there's a time where basically Jesus's family come to like tie him up and take him away. Like they think he's not. Like what's up with that? Like there, there are all these different parts that you just go like, where did that come from? And how does that play out? And what does that have to do? And what are they trying to tell us in the story about that? And the question, the, the real answer is, we got some good theories, but we don't really know. We're, we're just kind of on the edge of it with faith. Yes. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
so let me let me share that for the people on Zoom. So so that that, that that's a plausible theory. So so the, the idea here is the reason he silenced the demons is because although the demons would say part correct, they would get the rest really wrong and use it craftily and badly. Well, and and I would be willing to go with that to a point, except then why does he tell the other people who are healed the same thing? Yeah. 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 Because he also tells the other faithful humans the same thing, and it will even at some points tell the disciples who have gotten it, who he's trained, it's not the time yet. So, so that that's why that's why I, well, I'll go with the timing thing. But I like that theory. That's not a that's not a. I mean, I, I would I would I would hold on to that some. Uh, and it's, and in some of the other gospels, I would go with that preferred because in some of the other gospels, the people are able to get it, but the but the dark forces aren't. So yeah. Yeah, that's right. Right. Right, right. And and I agree with that in Linda's analysis of that, the idea that that him, because Satan's in, you know, trying to get him to do it was probably what made it a sin. Uh, however, I'm going to let Jesus decide what is a sin, because if Jesus thought by making the bread that Satan would have repented and believed, I think Jesus would have baked the bread. Right, so like I, I would, I would, uh, I'm, I'm gonna let Jesus decide what's sin and what's not sin, and I'm not gonna play that game. Yep, Linda. Yep. Yeah. So in other, that's right. That's right. So uh, there is a Samaritan woman in John's account that goes and tells everybody, you know, everybody the whole story, and he's tickled pink about that. Yeah, um, so again, I, I would say one of the things when we look at timing and who Jesus is okay knowing the Messiah, what gospel you're in really matters on that. You'll see that pattern emerge heavily. And there, it's, not, it's not a consistent thing across the different gospels. They had different views on that topic. Yeah, did, did Luke get his information for the other disciples? We do believe that Luke, as he said, went and got the other accounts and reports and was pulling those together. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I, and I believe, I would add to that, I believe, talk to Mary. That, that's my own kind of pet theory. Yeah. Right. So the disciples aren't there yet. You're going to see some more. Don't tell anybody after the disciples are there, though. Yeah, Peggy, that's that's great. Peggy was saying that the uh, uh, that a lot some of these uh, don't tell stories are before he has the disciples, uh, but there are some don't tell stories after the disciples. The biggest thing, well, again, the event of the transfiguration, you'll see it kind of pivots in Luke, but again. That doesn't work for all the different gospels. Each gospel has a different take on that. But that's a great question and a, and a, and a question that's that's pretty pretty common. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm willing to defer to uh, God being God and Brad not. So that's good. Well, anyway, friends, thank you all so much. Thank you. Good to see you all. Have fun.